welcome to the Donahue Group. Glad you could join us for a half an hour of interesting conversation of uh, mostly local flavor. We're a little bit smaller today. I'm going to introduce Ken Risto, social studies teacher and bon vivant, or just all <laughs> around South High School. Cal Potter, former state senator, just a, a maven of political life. I'm Mary Lynn Donahue um, with the firm of Hop Newman Humkey, just a simple city lawyer. Our dear friend Tom Paneski is not with us um, uh, during this taping, and we're not exactly sure why. <laughs> now, just because the Republicans lost, and that and may be the reason. That may, I think not. I think Standard actually <laughs> he, he may just not have been able to find a completely black mm -hmm. outfit to show up in, <laughs> and um, and so he uh, decided to skip. But in any event, we're uh, we're sad that Tom's not here. But uh, Tom. Too bad, buddy. <laughs> there are elections every four. There are elections every four years. There are elections every four years. And listen, the one lesson that I've learned, you know, there's nothing like a victory night on election night. I'm, you know, that that feeling of euphoria when you have won, I think, is pretty hard to duplicate. But there's always a fall. <laughs> I mean, after the after you know the dizzying heights, there's always a fall of some kind, and, right. and so. Uh, so the Tom, realities of the economy and everything else. Right, yep. right. Yeah. You have kind of sympathy for the poor, poor president. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, I thought we would start out by talking about uh, local results. Um, I was, as usual, at the administration building reporting votes for the League of Women Voters uh, to the Wisconsin Election Service. I left at about quarter to 12 in town of Wilson, town of Sheboygan. We're still not in. And Obama, who had been ahead the entire night, much to my enormous surprise here in Sheboygan County, um, was ahead by 81 votes. And I thought, eh, with the town of the Wilson and Sheboygan coming in, yeah. in fact, it would end up that he <coughs> would lose. And he did, but boy, not by much. And it was a great turnout. Uh, McCain, 30,796. Obama, 30,392. So just just about mm -hmm. 400 votes. Who to thunk it? We're still one of only 13 counties in the state that was red instead mm -hmm. of um, instead of blue. But uh, and the, and interesting, there were a bunch too. You know, Washington, Osaki, Sheboygan, Waukesha. Compared to, uh, but those are well-to-do communities. Yeah, and that's probably part of it. <laughs> <laughs> you'd expect you'd expect that from Waukesha. I mean, oh clearly. yeah. I mean, Clearly. Washington, Ozaki sure. counties, right. they'll, they'll never go blue, I don't think. But, I mean, Sheboygan County is, I mean, certainly we're prosperous enough here, but it's hardly the richest state in the county no. by any, by, or But in, you in saw the, the traditional split. Uh, Democrats did well in the city and took a bath in the rural area, and when you add the two together, it was a close, right. close uh, loss for Obama. Interestingly enough, Obama lost every village and town except for Glen Glenn Beulah. Beulah. Yes. You live out in the country. What's going <laughs> on in Glen Beulah? Well, I think Glen, yeah. Glen Beulah is not the, the hotbed of a, of, a, of a certain philosophy. I think when you think of Republican hotbeds, you think particularly of Oostburg, and mm -hmm. then you think of Cedar Grove, and uh, the towns of, of Lima and towns of Holland. That area of the county, I don't think Democrats do well ever. And when you start getting out of that area, you start getting into a a good mix of people, you know, Germans uh, mm -hmm. probably uh, go back far enough, you'll find German socialists who settled there. And I think the, the political thought is, is, is not so rigid. I mm -hmm. think that's part of it. Yeah. Plus, it's, it's not a real affluent community. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not a Kohler. I mean, Kohler's got uh, a lot of professionals. So I don't think Glenn Bulow fits the social economic yeah. uh, niche that a Kohler is in. So mm -hmm. I think that's probably part of it. I just thought it was swell <laughs> that, that there would be at least a, a village or a town that uh, that didn't uh, that didn't go red. What, but, was your, uh, what was your experience in voting? Um, I voted. Uh, we had state testing over at the high school, and I didn't have to proctor it on Tuesday, so I came into my polling area at about eight thirty in the morning, and I was in and out in ten minutes, and everything was running like clockwork. Uh, there were uh, it appeared advisor. I mean poll watchers for both parties there. Um, I didn't have the heart to tell them they were in violation of state law, they, but <laughs> they were supposed to keep a 10-foot distance uh, away from uh, 
the workers, but there was no place for them to stand in, in, in the way they had laid things out. But they were, they were just observing and watching, and I think things were going really well. I, I, I just breezed in. I breezed in at 7.30. I was the 205th voter, which was pretty amazing for my little ward. Um, and from what I understand, uh, that experience was relatively universal. There mm -hmm. were little bunches, you know, right before work and, um, yeah. and after work. But by and large, it was much more smooth than it was in 2004. I think the new rules for the election observers are very good. The Government Accountability Board um, put in place a whole raft of rules. I know in 2004, when my son tried to vote, and he was just 18 and he had registered and voted in the primary, but for some reason there was some glitch. You know, I went in to help him and there were these people just kind of swarming around us and there, was, there were loud voices and, and I was getting a little feisty in my own way, like back off and, and that sort of thing. Well, I think this is much more peaceable. The, the, the observers need to be six or 10 feet, whatever it is, away from, mm -hmm. uh, from, uh, from the, the voters action, yeah. and the, the, you know, everybody. Uh, they're not allowed to talk to anybody but the chief, whoever the chief poll person is. Um, so there's no interaction. Because I was yelling at this, well, not me, I don't yell. My voice was slightly You're raised. That person. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Were you admonishing him? I was admonishing him for, okay. a, for his surly behavior. But in any event, um, so I do think that that went better. But if you look at the photo that was in the Sheboygan Press, it is my understanding that the city clerk's office was inundated with voters yes, for were. weeks. Yes. yes. For weeks. Yes. And um, as and Kevin a, Kennedy has said that that's something that needs to be addressed because it's really absentee voting is what we have. We don't have advanced voting as what 29 other states do. Right. So we really need to address that problem. If that's going to be more the norm of how people vote, that this application stuff and then filling mm -hmm. it out, it's just a lengthy process that needs to be looked at, I think. Right. Well, I and think there was a recommendation today, right? Well, Kevin uh, Kennedy they, said he yeah. was going to meet with with municipal well, clerks, but he had some suggestions, and I don't know if he's advanced those or not. I think he was. There was some discussion that they would allow for early voting and and do away with absentee ballots. Right. Is the mm -hmm. discussion that they were talking about, okay. right. which it makes some sense because they were. When I was there, they were uh, opening. I think. I think when you vote, if I understand the process of the city, they, they take those ballots and move them to the precincts mm -hmm. because they were calling out people. There were some people that were busy and they were calling those out and counting those while I was there. Right. Because I recognized a couple of my neighbors' names who had voted early. Right. My wife had voted early and she, she walked up and said it was you know, in and out. Mm -hmm. You still do need to have absentee voters or voting for the people who can't make it into the polls. And um, you know, old people, and my mom got her absentee right. ballot mm -hmm. for every election, and you know, uh, yeah. and they made that easier. In the old days, you had to actually, I think, have your signature notarized, if I'm not mistaken, and that, of course, would be very difficult for housebound people and so forth. So, yeah. so I think that you know, those new new ideas are are good ones. Um, you can ask for a ballot after 65 years old to be mailed to you. Was that my understanding? Or if you're and, disabled. Or, or disabled, okay. And my son, Michael, is in Milwaukee, and, and he had his ballot mailed to him because he's registered in Sheboygan County but okay. wouldn't, be, wouldn't be in town for the election and military folks and so forth. So, so I think there still is a place for absentee balloting. It's just now it's become early voting, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, and there's got to be a, you know, a slightly better way. One of the problems, uh, if you'll recall from the Leibham Baumgart recount, is that uh, when they were manually feeding every single ballot through the machines again to verify counts, absentee ballots, because of where they're folded, folded. Right. If, you know, it can interfere with the, the connecting, uh, the connecting um, arrow. And uh, so that makes it more difficult as well. And uh, so I think, uh, you know, there are certainly better ways of doing it. Yeah. Um, we will get into this if we have time in, the, in our state uh, section, but um, Attorney General Van Hollen, after losing his uh, voter registration um, lawsuit, is now going to appeal and, uh, and is going to file with the Court of Appeals, but they'll probably certify it up to the, uh, to the Supreme Court right away. So, so that'll be interesting to see if and how that's um, taken care of. Yeah. So, yeah. In any event, we had some other winners. Um, it was certainly 
generally a time for uh, incumbents. Um, Terry Van Akron won handily. Um, he, um, well, many of us, reward, I think. yeah, I mean, it was 16,000 to 8,000 uh, pretty much. You didn't, you just didn't see much of a Piper, Alex Piper, the opponent, uh, mm -hmm. did not see much of a, a race. I didn't think. Well, I heard he didn't qualify for public financing, which was something that Jose did. And so that means he didn't get a grant of what's $8,000, which puts you out in the media at least. Right. So if you're, if you're relying on whatever comes in the coffee can as you're, as you're campaigning, you're not gonna be able to do too much uh, visible media stuff. Right, well, well I didn't realize It's just surprising that. because all you need is uh, I think 10% of your spending limit, which is a heck of a lot. Usually to, Republicans have an easy time of it because they just get a few fat cats to write a hundred dollar check and pretty now soon. Cal. <laughs> well, it is. I, mean, I, I had you know, I had to go out and beg viral twenty dollars from this person and ten dollars from that person. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a lot of people writing hundred dollar checks, but no, that's from experience. No, I, I mean, when, when we I don't have the, Tom here. <laughs> no, when I was in the legislature, it wasn't uncommon for uh, candidates uh, on the other ticket to uh, have a number of checks written in the zip code of River Hills and so on, mm -hmm. by people who could write those checks sure. of a hundred or more dollars. And, sure. and, and you add those up, you know, and pretty soon you get the qualifying threshold to give that candidate $8,000 for at least buy some media time. Right. So yeah. by not doing it, it means somebody dropped the ball on a very elementary thing of a couple, you know, just a little bit of effort. Yeah. You could have gotten a number of hundred dollar checks signed by people who had, who are died in the wool Republicans, and that person then would have well, gotten the grant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, um, I don't think the Republicans were gonna put any money into this race, and uh, so, so there you go. Yeah. Steve Castell won handily against his opponent, um, yeah, his Bob opponent, Cox. opponent, unfortunately, uh, had bypass surgery, I believe, in the middle of the campaign, which took him out of commission, so. Um, well, then, then his vote total is not too bad. It was 14000 to 7000 essentially. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he campaigned early at all. I knew he was at the fair, and after that, uh, his health problems got okay. him. And that was the last I saw of him, really. Right. And Glenn Grothman was challenged by an independent. Um, uh, Senator Grothman absolutely schvetzed Mr. Winter. It was almost 10,000 votes to about 2,000 votes. And uh, so um, I think... Uh, it's not surprising. I mean, he... Really right. beat Mary Panzer very handily. Oh, he which, did. Um, he did. That was somewhat of a surprise because she was an incumbent and mm -hmm. I thought a reasonable lady, and she really got beat by Glenn Grothman. So that mm -hmm. shows the devotion to the conservative side in that Senate district. He's astonishingly conservative as yes, well. Yes, he is, very um, much so. When I um, was still in the school board, I went to legislative breakfasts and then also with our representation of the county, go to legislative breakfasts from time to time. And uh, I was really astonished sometimes by just some of his proposals. They were really, to me, seemed substantially to the right of Leibham or Castell. Um, so that was, that was interesting. Mm -hmm. and, um, but he's a character. He's, yes. he's an interesting guy. He's a lawyer. He's one of four lawyers in the Senate. And um, so, and I don't want any smart talk from anybody about that. Um, I am, um, uh, Kittleson, Petri, uh, Petri uh, beat Kittleson, you know, pretty handily. I don't think anybody really expected anything different there. No, Kittleson mm. didn't have any money really compared to the big account that uh, Petri had plus the years of incumbency exactly. that Petri had plus his reputation. I think he's viewed as a, not a, more of a moderate Republican. I do, I, I think know. so. So how much yep. is voting record really matches that, but that's his image at least. Mm -hmm. um, one of the um, uh, one of the interesting pieces of, and it's just gotten to be a tradition, and I don't think it was always a tradition. Uh, I was out of town for a couple of days after the election. I came back, and um, you can't really, I'm not even gonna show it on screen because uh, I don't think the camera could pick it up even though we have wonderful cameramen who are just so terrific and, 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 uh, and able to do all sorts of interesting things. But it was the sign waivers um, at 14th and Erie. And uh, you know, when I ran for judge, we had a whole contingent of people there the entire day. 
Um, Maeve Quinn is very good at organizing people up mm -hmm. for the 8th Street Rotary. Mm -hmm. um, and they have McCain and, and, um, and Obama people sharing the same corner and so forth. And uh, I thought it was great fun. It's just, you know, people who really are too shy to knock on doors, they don't want to make telephone calls, give them a sign and they'll stand out uh, on corners and you know, take, stand there. Take the yelling and the gestures. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or the horn honking. You know, I, I was, I don't know, I stood on a corner for, you know, three, four hours and people were great. It was just wonderful. And, uh, you know, if they're impolite, at least you just don't see it. So, so it's, it's not too bad. Does but. it really make it, I mean, is, do you think anybody's actually persuaded by, by that? I think what it does is it um, tends to pump people up. We're going to pump you up, okay. and um, I do think it does. Um, there, um, it may remind people to vote, mm -hmm. and of course, on a presidential election, that's not, not a big deal. But you know, if in April elections and so forth, it reminds people mm -hmm. that oh, that's right, it's a voting day, and it makes people feel excited about their candidates, and you know, who knows? You know, I don't know how well it worked, but. The Obama observer in my polling area, um, I don't think was at all concerned about uh, nefarious activity at the polls. I think what she was doing was, it seemed like she was crossing names off of lists, and I know the national Obama plan, I don't know if they did it in Sheboygan, was to, in real time, uh, at a certain point in the day at noon, I guess at 3 o'clock, and, and again at 6 o'clock, they were going to... Uh, see who had not, from their lists of likely candidate and voters from their canvassing in the neighborhoods, they were going to compare that list to who hadn't voted yet and make telephone calls right. and see if they can actually help people get there and remind people to get there who hadn't voted yet. Yeah. And I've never seen that happen before. That was pretty interesting business. It's called the Houdini system. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and that's why the poll worker said, you need to say your name and address loudly. So they can hear and <laughs> so, check off. So they could, they, so they could check off. Okay. Um, I was listening to a um, National Public Radio uh, discussion of how different Obama's campaign had been just in terms of doing those intense kind of grassroots things mm -hmm. uh, that heretofore have been relatively unknown um, so that you would actually... Um, and I know when I've been doing canvassing, they want a lot of information from people. And so it's not just going up to the door and saying, gee, I wish you'd vote for Obama or I wish you'd vote for McCain. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, what are your issues? Dot, you know, and on and on and on. All gets entered into a database. And so that is just one of the ways because the bottom line is you have to get people out mm -hmm. to vote. And unless you're in Oregon where you vote by mail, and, you know, who knows, who knows how that system works. But... Uh, so I don't know how well it worked, really. I haven't. I heard not very. Yeah. Well, if you've got to be 10 feet away, you have to have better hearing than I have, I guess, to, to hear somebody's name and then check it off. And well, again, my, poll, my polling area, they weren't. They were sitting literally right at the end of the table, both mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. um, because of the way the room was set up, I'm not quite sure where they could have stood. Uh, that would have been in compliance with the law. Incidentally, speaking of compliance with the law, oh, the lawyer, well. lawyer that you are, <laughs> Um, well, this is exciting. Polling uh, signs, uh, yard signs, uh, distance from a polling area. Um, 200 feet. Is it 200 or 200 300? Feet. Doesn't make any difference if it's private or public property. It's got to be well, 200 feet. Well, you shouldn't have you shouldn't have signs on public property for yeah. goodness sake. Right. I know that happened in a school board race once mm -hmm. in a distant galaxy many many years ago, where we had a particular candidate's um, signs in schoolyards and. Thankfully, that didn't. <laughs> yeah, they shouldn't be on public too property yeah, ever. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. But it is. It can be very tricky when you are the candidate to drive around and make sure that there are no signs. Yeah. You know, within X number of feet. Yeah. And I usually, when I ran, I usually took them up down, whether if they were in a block or so of it, so nobody started saying, "Where does the 200 feet begin or 300 feet?" You know, does it yeah, begin be from like at Wilson School? Is it across? Is it mm. the sidewalk of Wilson School or is it the front door? You know, so I just. Down. There were campaign um, signs right on the entryway of the parking lot of my precinct. Well, that, that probably was not a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think what happened was, uh, I think folks from that particular party just in the evening just put them up in the hopes that nobody would notice. Hmm. And my so. view is, if you're going into a polling place and you're going to make your decision based on a 
yard sign yeah. that is within 100 feet of the pole. <laughs> That's really an undecided sake. voter. That's really yeah. an undecided voter. Yeah. And um, so yeah. I think, um, you know, in my view, it's probably not a big deal. No. But in any event, it was an historic election, and yeah. uh, we'll talk, as I said, more in our next uh, in our next exciting segment about state results and and so forth. But um, it definitely is a sea change. Just wanted to talk about a couple of other things um, coming up at long last, and I think we're all delighted about it. November fifteenth at nine thirty a.m. the opening of the the ribbon cutting for the new police station, which. Um, really looks like a police station if you've driven by it. it there's, there's nothing pretentious, about charming it. about the building. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's all business, which is as it should sure. be, sure. and uh, came in $500,000 uh, under budget. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I think, uh, I think that's actually a pretty exciting time yeah. for... It looks very for, functional. It does, doesn't it? Yes, and it does. Um, so there, um, there was a long article in the newspaper about... Um, being able to move into bigger offices, and they really did deserve a better space. So, oh, yeah. so I think that's pretty yeah. exciting. It'll be interesting to see how City Hall gets remodeled. Mm -hmm. My own view is the mayor's office should be on the first floor. You shouldn't have to truck up, you know, two flights of stairs to um, to get to the to the mayor's office. And um, so it's uh, it's it's Except hard to know. Except for security, I don't know if I'd want to be on the first floor. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. We had that problem in the Capitol. Um, it was always nice for you know people to say, well, I'd like to be on the first floor. I says, you don't want to be on the first floor. There's a lot of people who walk into the first floor looking very lost. <laughs> and uh, you end up with people uh, that are there that might not normally come into your office. Yeah. I suppose. In these public buildings. And of course, there won't be a police department there to protect <laughs> exactly. the That's mayor. Right. So. Well, I think they'll have to consider, on, you know, unfortunately, That's, given the times we live in, they're going to have to really think about that in the remodeling process, about um, the accessibility, of course, that you want of a city hall, but also those kinds of issues. Yeah. Well, there's nothing that irritates me more. The clerk of court's office and the DA's office are now both behind glass in the courthouse. And um, particularly with the clerk of court's office, and I don't mean to be to underestimate the issues that people right at the front have to deal with in terms of people who come in who are irate or whatever. But, you know, when you have to yell to get through those plexiglass windows and so forth, um, you know, those are things that I, um, that I just think are, I think they're horrible. So, and right now the mayor's office, I think, is probably off, off the screen enough. So you're, you're probably right there. So we'll see how that happens. And then I do think we're getting close to the end, but um, just talking about the layoffs that are now starting to affect the community. And um, the um, Kohler is laying off 80. Mm -hmm. They had previously uh, laid off 50 in the hospitality. The 80, as I understand, is in, in, the, brass division. in the brass division. So mm -hmm. um, I think um, my sense is hard times are coming. Sure. I don't think we've really seen the ripple effect of the downturn in the auto industry and other yeah. industries uh, when people lose their jobs in those industries and dealerships and others don't do well. It just keeps on feeding on itself. So I think, you know, most people have said we haven't seen the worst of it yet. Right. And uh, I think Lear is going to be laying off whenever the auto industry is in trouble. Sure. Lear is in trouble. Exactly. So, uh, so I think that's going to be tough. This is a little off point, but do you conceive of the big automakers like literally shutting down, going out of business? I mean. I don't know. No, I don't either. I know that there's discussion, of course, with the new administration coming in and already some discussion. Speaker Pelosi and Majority Leader Reid met with UAW and uh, General Motors and Ford. I know General Motors was in the room. I'm not sure about Ford. And they're looking for another, what, $35 billion, another $30 billion uh, to uh, get them through the next year or so, because I think that if they can get out the end of that year, they, they're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're right. I, you know, we were talking off camera before the, before the show started that uh, we're starting to see this deindustrialization of Sheboygan really have an effect on the, the, you know, the kids that come into our school buildings. Uh, it used to be not that terribly long ago that maybe 20% of our students would qualify for hot, free or reduced hot lunch. That's sort of the standard we use. Uh, to uh, designate kids of poverty. And uh, 
I think we're close in the district to 40% now, or getting real close to that number when I looked at the third Friday counts. And, and, you, and, and there are more and more people working at night and working two jobs, and it's really having a strain on, on families, and it really affects, affects kids. And then on top of that, you know, because I work in a high school, we're trying to find, you know, talking to students who are looking for summer work, it's going to be very, very difficult this year for kids to find summer work or part-time work. And even the kids coming back from college or even like the alumni come back and talk and check in a little bit with me, and they are having the same experiences too. So it's going to be a tough summer all the way around for employment. Um, I think you'll recall that when um, Reagan was elected, um, certainly the country was in the midst of a pretty nasty recession. And it, there was a short recovery, and then it re-recessed. And... Um, I think, um, I remember Reagan saying, stay the course. So I think that Obama, in many ways, because we haven't, as far as I can tell in my limited understanding, we haven't even begun to bottom out in terms of the, the ripple effect of, of the job losses and, and um, just the difficulties that we're going to see. And so I think, you know, my own view is that, that it's, it's it's interesting is just where does the money keep coming from and how big can the deficit get? Right. How much can countries in the Middle East and China own in America? Apparently quite a lot, <laughs> at least as, as things are going now. But, um, but I think it, it'll be interesting. Kohler, I mean, the Kohler company, considering that it has I think 35,000 employees worldwide has been very loyal to Sheboygan mm -hmm. and loyal to a workforce, a good workforce, but one that's been obviously unionized for, for many years and, and is well paid and has decent benefits and you know long and hard fought over. But uh, um, I'm just, I just don't see the, I don't see any light at the end of this particular grim, grisly tunnel and uh, just the election of Obama, I don't, I don't think that solves those problems. No, nope. absolutely not. Well, you look at the, you know, the state, we'll maybe talk maybe the next, next uh, segment of our show about the state budget, but I don't know how, given the state finances, they're going to be able to meet their commitments to, to local education this, this next budget. Uh, exactly. And if that happens, you're going to see local school districts like Sheboygan, who's student enrollment has really pretty much leveled out now, give or take, you know, 10,000, give or take a couple of dozen here and there. Um, they're going to have some really difficult times, and so there's going to be some real tough choices facing our local school board, I suspect. We're already talking about places like Plymouth cuts. where the referendum didn't yep. pass, and they were a low-spending district to start out with. Yeah, yeah. and boy, yeah. The, the Mark Ryan in particular worked that very hard, and, and Clark Reinke, the, the, the superintendent, and that really is a heartbreaker for those folks. Well, we must bid adieu, but hope that we will see you again.